But what kind of a person makes heaven? Still working on this happiness thing, though. Hopefully, we figure it out in the next 60 to 90 years, huh? Oh, yeah. So, if this is what heaven is, pe other people. So, what are the parts of, of other people that make them hell? Not funny. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite, not funny. Selfish. Selfish. Narcissistic. Narcissistic. Oh my God, how do you say that in English? In the what? Huh? I didn't understand. What's the word in Spanish, but I don't know how to say it in English. I'm out of battle. Like, I'm out of battle, I don't know how to explain it. Bitter? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Bitter people. So people who are selfish, narcissistic, and bitter. Not like us, right? <laughs> Not like any of us in this room. <laughs> mm. You know you are these things, though, right? Maybe that's the thing that creates the hell, though. It isn't just being these things. Because you know you are these things. But that's not what we show the world. We show the world that we're funny, that we're empathetic, and that we're happy. But inside, we realize that we're actually selfish, narcissistic, and bitter. And all kinds of other things. Um, I guess I, I could ask you to raise your hand, I suppose, if you're... Um, tell me, are you narcissistic, selfish, and bitter? Or are you funny, empathetic, and happy? And the answer for most of us is probably both. yes. Yeah, for both. I, I'm, we're different things at these different times. And so one of the things that, that, that you can think of hell as, so first I've tried this, how long does hell last? Eternity. Eternity. It's forever. Um, why don't you just leave? You can't. Well, why not? Well, you're trapped. Shit. <laughs> so we're trapped in hell for all of eternity, and that's completely out of our power, right? I don't, know how to ex I don't know how to ask this question. I'm going to try and ask this in a way that maybe we'll get to the answer. Is there any other I don't know, context, maybe, in which we find ourselves trapped completely out of our power and we cannot escape from it? There is another, another area that that happens. Prison? You can escape. Was, yeah, you can always ask me maybe to escape prison, though. There's a place you cannot escape, though. And again, no, I'm not asking the question well, because I don't know if we're going to find the answer if I'm asking the question that way. But there is another, maybe, place that we cannot escape from. We can think we can. We can influence it, maybe a little bit. But we can never leave it. Your What's mind? That? That? Your mind? Almost. Yes, your mind is a big... Or... Your heart? There's no... no. <laughs> the mind, yeah. <laughs> Reality. We can... Drugs are good for that, right? <laughs> By the way, don't do drugs, right? <laughs> I don't do drugs. <laughs> it's very close. It does connect with your mind. Your mind, by the way, drugs will help you to do that, but, but you're still living in reality. You're living in a distorted version of reality. Absolutely. But if not your mind, someone else's mind. The minds of others. Yes. Yes. It's very difficult to escape your own mind, but you do have some modicum of control over that. You can force yourself to behave in certain ways, to, to act as though you trust. Oh, man. You can act as though, as though you trust. You can act as though, like, for example, if you're not confident, what can you do? Work on it. Work on it. And how do you do that? Yeah, you do stuff that will gain you confidence. You can sort of work on that. But if you think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a giant puckering egg hole, there's not, maybe there's not a lot I can do about that. And that's part of the, of, of the, the dilemma, the human dilemma. That we get trapped in a certain way in the minds of other people. And then they behave towards us as though that's the real reality. So in other words, if I think that you are selfish, narcissistic, and bitter, and so I decide I'm not going to trust you. And in fact, I'm going to work against you. I'm going to make sure that you don't get those promotions at work and all that. What if you really are this thing? It almost doesn't matter what you are. It almost matters that it, what matters more is like what people perceive you to be. Because that's how you're going to have to function in reality, if this makes sense. Now, the really hard part is when we come to realize that, um, that how people see us, we can kind of get a glimpse into it. So an example would be, 
Let's say that you approach a door and you have the key, the little keyhole in the door. So you, there's, there are people in a room, and so you kind of bend down and you're peering through the keyhole into the other room. Now, what would they think about you if they saw you peering into the keyhole into the other room, staring at them? <laughs> they would think of you as they a think creep. you're weird. What's that? They would think of you as a creep. They'll think of you as a creep. And so, are you a creep? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Probably, if you're peering through the keyhole, maybe you're just kind of curious to know what's going on. Why not knock on the door? Because you're you're intentionally viewing people who in, in secret. So now you, you get a very quick glimpse of how people would perceive you, and you get a very quick glimpse about what would be proper for them, because you realize it's accurate. You know, they don't like, like, you're a creeper, and you're peering in there, and then people catch you, and you're like, he's a creeper! No, I'm, I'm, I'm not! Yeah, you are. Um, <laughs> but I was, uh, then we had to pause and think about a way to, to explain away. And there's a level of shame that's there. And the point is that I wonder, like I've joked before, oh, maybe not joked before, maybe I was telling the truth, when, you know, when a loved one dies and people tell you, don't worry, they're, they're watching over you right now. How long should that last? You know, would you, if, if, you, uh, if you lost someone close to you, um, how long would you want them to watch over you? Would you want them taking breaks? Because yeah. that means they're watching over you all the time. Oh, hell no. Uh-huh. <laughs> Think about all those things. And now that, now that person who was your loved one is going to see exactly who you are. Because they're going to see all the things that you do in private, like peer through the keyhole and, and whatever else. So now... This is, this is hell, because this is the shame that you feel, because you start to realize, holy crap, I am that thing that people would think terribly about. And it's even worse, because you know all of those things about yourself. And then if other people discovered about you as well, well, there's an intense shame that's there. So it's this idea that the very existence of other people necessitates shame from you, because you don't want people to find out who you really, well, you wouldn't want people to find out who you really are. And this is, and by, by the way, this is probably just intuitively true on the surface. We understand this because otherwise we would behave in the ways that we behave everywhere else, at, you know, out in public. Um, I've mentioned one guy before, Diogenes, the philosopher, and he's probably the last guy who ever did who ever did that. He behaved exactly the same in public as he did everywhere else. But that's that dilemma because what's one of the things that makes life meaningful? You know, if you, you by yourself. You are tiny. There's a, I mean, there's a couple of ways of thinking about yourself. You can think of yourself as just as one little speck of dust among seven billion other specks of dust that are in the world. Or you can think of yourself as one little node that's connected in, in just a few steps from all seven billion people on the planet. In the very first case, you're tiny. You're just kind of like, you know, going through, you know, you're kind of being blown through the room by, by, the, winds, by the, uh, the currents of chance. In the second case, at least you're connected to people. It's one of the reasons that we join groups. If I ask you if you're a member of a, of a club, why? Well, because by doing so, you join yourself to other people. And so, let's say that you're only worth, you know, 0. 0.0001. Of course, you're worth less than that. But let's say that you're worth that much right there. And then you join a club with four other people. How much are you worth now? Now you're worth 0. 0.0004. But... It's three times what you were worth before, but it's still not worth a lot. But the size of the group that you can join yourself to, well, now you kind of make yourself meaningful and valuable, far beyond just you by, you, you, know, you by yourself. It's one of the reasons that we want to get married and have families with a lot of people. Because by being just you, you're just this one meaningless person bounding around the world. But as soon as you connect yourself to other people, you have meaning that extends beyond you. And <coughs> yes, there can be that certain level of shame. But that's why we like those people who are close to us. Because even if they don't know about us peering to the keyhole, they don't know that part of us. But maybe they do know um, about our bad breath, or that we fart in our sleep, yeah. <laughs> or any of these other kinds of things. Because they know us at a level, and they accept us at a level that nobody else does. It helps to kind of decrease and lower that, that level of shame that people can feel toward, that we feel, just by, just by virtue of the fact of being known. But that's a really hard thing to escape from, for a lot of us. Because as soon as people get these impressions of us, especially bad impressions of us. You know? I'm thinking about, um, geez, I know of a, of a student who is here who did some things, I guess, a few years ago that brought this person a great deal of shame. Um, 
he did it when he was when he was very young. You know, and it almost begs this question of at what point do you get redemption and what point do you not get redemption? And um, I've, I've heard students who would talk about this person, and I ask this question, well, how, how, how long does this person have to go before you forgive him for something that they did? And they're like, that's unforgivable what he did. Really? There's unforgivable things? Yes. And then you'll be surprised when people call you religious. You know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, but you're acting like one. You get to determine who, who gets redemption, who gets forgiveness, and who doesn't. Your problem isn't with God, your problem is that you're not God. So you're pretending to be, and that gives you a sense of power. The problem is you're not a very good God, because you're not, just, you're not merciful, you're not just, you don't have all wisdom, you certainly aren't all loving. But we still pass judgment like we are. And so I was asking these people, well, how far into his future should he, should he be able to get redemption? They said, never. I said, then why don't you just encourage him to hang himself? Why don't you encourage him to, to kill himself? Maybe you should be putting your time and energy into that because you've told him you can't be redeemed. Your life is meaningless. You should murder yourself. And then if that person did that, I wonder how many of them would feel good about that. Like, yeah, we really did something positive today. We got a person to kill himself who, 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 did, something, who did something stupid when he was 12 years old. Good. Now he should die. Well, we wouldn't think of it that way because one other thing that we lack as being gods is courage. So we would be thinking it, but we wouldn't have the courage to actually encourage the person to do it. And then if they did, well, we've, all, we've obviously demonstrated that we're not all loving, so again, maybe we're just not very good gods at all. Maybe we should kind of get away from that idea of trying to elevate ourselves and instead examine ourselves. You know, the world doesn't need more, more, more criticisms. The world needs more, more self-awareness. So if we make ourselves self-aware, well, then maybe we can become a better person. But, of course, there goes that shame again that, that comes along with self-awareness. Yes? Is giving a second chance, like even if it's not the same chance for him before, is it the same thing as forgiving someone? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. But can you forgive a person who doesn't get a second chance? I don't know. Like, if you, um, if you guys come into my room and I'm not here, and you steal my... You steal my Julius Caesar statue over there. And I catch you walking, I catch you in the hallway with it. And I, I take it back from me. I said, you've stolen this from me? You, you, you're never allowed back in my room. I can't trust you in there. Well, how can, I ever, how can I ever trust you again? Don't I have to let you back in the room with the Julius Caesar statue? To give you an opportunity to prove that you've grown past that? I don't know that you can get redemption without a second chance. And I don't know what good a second chance is without the, the, the enticing carrot of redemption. Now, I wonder how many of us wake up in the morning and say, I want to be a bad person and I want to feel terrible shame for the, things I, for the things I am and the things that I do. I wonder how many of us wish we could buy back the past. And I promise you, none of us is wealthy enough to buy back our pasts. So it's an interesting thing. Interesting thing. So that's what it is. Hell is that thing that we get locked in by other people's impressions of us. Um, the worst part is when it's accurate, when we get caught peering to the people. It's also very bad when it's not true. But at least when it's not true, you can fall back on this idea of I'm being persecuted for things that weren't that I, I actually didn't do. And you can join a long list of history's martyrs in that. But man, when you know it, and you actually did do it, and then you live a life of trying to avoid anybody else ever finding out. And depending on your past, that can be a full-time job. It can be a full-time job. So, I think you're right. I think that heaven can be other people. If, if it's true that hell is other people, maybe it's possible that heaven can be other people. Unless, if we can get over that shame thing. Yeah. What the world do you do? Stole a bike lock. A what? <laughs> Stole a bike lock. Oh, I actually. No, I won't tell you. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't the point of the story. Yeah. But really, that, that, that could go back to just about anything. Like, how, how bad of a thing does a person have to do? And here's how we normally identify how bad the thing has to be. We imagine the worst thing we could possibly do, and then the next thing. That's the one thing that can't be forgiven. If you go past that line, no way. But aren't you right up against that line? Yes, but... I didn't do what they did. <laughs> Good person right here. Good person.
people, the, the level of horrible things that people do, by the way, a lot of times is, it comes down to opportunity. Remember, I began by saying that when I'm a dictator, I'm going to, to ban war. There will be no more war. By the way, how do I, how can I enforce that? Your words. What's that? With your words alone. My words alone? Good luck, right? When you guys are in the room and you're supposed to be listening to me, do you think the world's going to listen? Yeah, so, I, so how else can I end war? War. War, yeah, I just got to kill my enemies. Once there's no one left to kill, then there's no more war, right? Yeah. Good, okay. Um, why haven't I committed a genocide yet? Opportunity. Don't have the stuff to do it. Man. But if only I could find some soldiers, some very wise, energetic, and strong people. Children. I want children. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you guys are made of the right stuff to help me carry out this genocide. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, to, to, to make the world a better place. <laughs> I wonder if you're... Not everybody can join me, you understand. You have to be a very special caliber of person to join me. How, what do you mean? Well, I don't know if you're good enough. What do you mean I'm not good enough? Of course I'm good enough to carry out genocide. Alright, let's find out. Come on, <laughs> let me test you first. Yeah, you're going to find that a lot of times that we, ha we haven't committed horrible crimes yet. And we haven't done terrible sins yet because we just haven't had the opportunity. Maybe it's also true, by the way, that you haven't saved a person's life because you haven't had the opportunity to. Or maybe we can... Uh, Maybe you haven't done the horrible things of other people in history because you haven't had the opportunity to. You know? um, I don't remember if it was in this class. I was talking with one of my classes a while back about how I'd like to like, do, have like a, a TV show um, about, about El Chapo, but he never becomes an actual drug lord because some things go differently in his life, but instead he, starts to, he manages a Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so the whole thing is he has that same personality, but he runs a Dunkin' Donuts instead of running a drug cartel. And then by the same token, you can take Bill Gates and pull him out of Microsoft and then put him at the head of the, of the Sinaloa cartel and then see how that goes down. See how he changes it. Take two people and you, you just kind of swap them out that way. I don't know, maybe, maybe Bill Gates hasn't carried out a, a mass execution. Only be, Well, maybe he has, right? But maybe he hasn't carried out a mass execution. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> All of a sudden, everything just shuts down in the room, the door is locked. <laughs> Maybe he hasn't carried out a, a mass execution because he hasn't had the opportunity to, to yet. I wonder, he, he, I don't know, he seems like the kind of guy who would just go, oh, they're in our way, huh? Yeah, all right, just kill them all. And maybe Chapo became what he became because he didn't have the opportunities to, to manage Dunkin' Donuts. I, I don't know. I guess it'd be a good question to ask him. Maybe if we asked him 15 years ago, would you rather be doing what you're doing or managing a Dunkin' Donuts? He'd, he'd laugh at him. I wonder if you asked him right now, if we let you out of prison, would you manage Dunkin' Donuts? Would you be, you know, would you be okay with that? Course, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe, probably. Probably anywhere is better than, than, than uh, um, Supermax prison in Colorado. So, that's why it's important for us to know ourselves. But when you know ourselves, oh man, then you gotta know yourself. And real help is when other people know us as we really are. Because there's no escaping that. You're trapped there, just like you're trapped in hell. And you're not being tortured with fire and, and brimstone, but you're being tortured in a, very, in, in, a, in a really strong psychological way. Maybe we go through the world hoping nobody figures out who we really are. Perhaps that's why a lot of our existence is, is, is bent towards ensuring each other that our, that our costumes of identity are on straight. Okay. <clears throat> you look okay, no one's going to figure you out. How about me? Oh yeah, you look good too, no one's going to figure you out. Okay, let's go. You know, think of it that way. But a lot of times this is what it is. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticism, critiques. Yeah. I'm absolutely convinced I could take John Paul Sartre in a fight. <laughs> you go what? I could take him in a fight. He's a little gangly thing, man. I don't feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> Help! No, he's kicking my ass. <laughs> you said you could take me. <laughs> Is he really kicking my ass? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but are you really kicking my ass? Do you really exist right now? <laughs> Hell is getting your ass kicked by John Paul's heart. <laughs> no, anybody else do that? Or am I the only one? What? Like, like, like people pop up and you're like, oh, okay. yeah, Obama. I could take Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I'll for that. I'll yeah, there's always, I, I was either that. I'm watching something I'm like, and I'll, I'll be like, I don't know, man. LeBron's got reach, you know? <laughs> I don't know if I could take LeBron. I always thought about that with like, like I, I, could, I could take Killer. Easy. Easy. 
I could take Mussolini, I could take Pol Pot. I don't know if I could have taken Joseph Stalin, because he was apparently he was a street brawler, just a tough dude. I'm like, I don't know. Bin Laden? I don't think I couldn't take Bin Laden. Wow. I mean I could today. But I could go find his body, dig him up, and stop his bones. <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't take Bin Laden like uh, you know, normally. Because Bin Laden, I think he was like what, six five, six six, something like that? So he had he had he had really good reach. Um, but he was also a legit black belt in judo. So yeah, so if I could, if I was able to, to get past the reach, I get in close. He's able to, to you know to grapple and, and toss. So I don't know that I could have taken Bin Laden. I would have done the fight, but I don't know if I would have taken him. I don't know. Sorry, but I know I could beat. I know I could take him off. Oh, sorry.